Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social TV magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Bospuya. In this week's program, we'll be discussing who's to blame for the terrorist attacks in Paris and Copenhagen. We'll be also showing Mariam's uh, recent speech at the uh, conference on apostasy and Sharia law where she pays tribute to Charlie Hebdo and other dissidents. In shocking news of the week, we'll be discussing the tragic execution of Salman Nassim, a young political prisoner who was imprisoned at the age of 17. And in the insane fatwa of the week, it's from Khamenei, who's, uh, who's basically said that in an Islamic Republic, there is no attacks against non-Muslims. Following Paris and Copenhagen, the reasons behind the terrorist attacks have been heatedly debated. Those on the far right will say it's because of Muslim immigration, whilst those on the anti-imperialist left will blame US militarism and racism in Europe as the cause for terrorism. In fact, Islamism, the far right fascist movement, is directly responsible. I mean, there have been a lot of discussions on the terrorist attacks in Copenhagen and Paris, and one of the strands of this debate is that Muslims and Muslim immigration is to blame. So you have people saying that there should no longer be any Muslim immigrants allowed in Europe. And again, this is you know a ridiculous and absurd statement because yeah. the fact of the matter is, and something that we've said very often on this program, is that Mus there is no you know homogeneous Muslim group. There are people who are also Muslims but who have as many different beliefs and opinions and stand in as many different political groupings and positionings as anybody else anywhere in the world. Yeah, I, th I think with, uh, after any sort of major incidents, all political strands, and they try to give their own narratives of what's happening. The racists blame the immigrants, you know, the uh, you know, people who have interests, people who support the Islamists to try to sort of blame somebody else. But the reality is that, you know, a, a, a real analysis shows that these terrorist acts are carried out by the Islamists and we need to hold them accountable. Specifically re regarding the right wing, um, f you know, fascist movement in Europe who blames immigrants, uh, that's what they, you know, that, that, that's what they try to stir up sort of xenophobia and racism mm -hmm. and actually they contribute to the rise of the um, Islamists because they are um, shutting down and preventing people to have a proper debate on the cause of the terrorist attacks. And I think they are part and parcel of the feed from the Islamists and the Islamists from the feed from the, from the right being. And they sort of continue this ding dong between the two. I think that's the, that's the major issue. The ding dong between the two, okay, that's, that's a good way of putting it. I mean, I think in a sense, when you look at it, you've got the anti imperialist left, you've got the far right. They often use very similar arguments. They reach different positions, but they use similar arguments. They both see Muslims as a homogeneous grouping. So one side will say, if you criticize Islamism, you're actually attacking Muslims. And the far right will say, if you support Muslims, you're supporting Islamism. Mm -hmm. And they don't see the people that is, you know, so different and, and you know, part and parcel of humanity. And also they're refusing to put the blame where the, it should be. And this is the right-wing fascist Islamist movement. Yeah. And people need to recognize it. This is and, important. I mean, one of the other things that's interesting is if you're, you know, attacking the Christian right in the U.S., people won't say, well, you can't criticize Christianity because it'll feed into racism and all of the sort of arguments that are used against Islamism, you mm. know. So here, if you want to criticize Islam, suddenly you're feeding into the sort of anti-Muslim bigotry. And again, that's not true because this is a belief. Beliefs should be open to mm. criticism. On the other hand, people should be, I think, held sacred, really, and, and, and treated with respect and also seen to be citizens and human beings before their religious affiliations. No, I agree. And, and most of the <coughs> people labeled as Muslim are the first victims of, victims of the Islamic regime. But I think that brings us to a good point to go and listen to your speech um, at the conference, recent conference that we had.
um, dissent and criticism of religion has always been a crucial aspect of free expression. Historically, it's been intrinsically linked with anti-clericalism and dismantling that which is deemed taboo, sacred, and untouchable by the gatekeepers of power. Such criticism has been key for human progress and is still needed. In the age of ISIS, this criticism is a life and death necessity for those living under Islamism's boot. So yes, I am Charlie, no ifs and buts. Those who condemn the massacre in Paris but blame Charlie for offending Muslim sensibilities, implying that they somehow got what they deserved, have bought into the Islamist narrative that Muslims are more offended by cartoons than mass murder. This is validated by multiculturalism as a social policy and cultural relativism, which sees Muslim communities and societies as homogeneous and one and the same with the religious right. So even though there is a rich historical tradition, both artistic and historical, of depicting Muhammad, Islam's prophet, over many centuries, it's deemed offensive today. And despite many Muslims or those labeled as such having sided with Charlie, it is the terrorists, the fascists, who are deemed to be the authentic Muslims. This homogenized culture of offense discounts the many believing secularists, feminists, free thinkers, and also atheists and socialists amongst those deemed Muslim. It ignores the widespread dissent and resistance, which can also be seen in the response to Charlie. An Algerian copy editor, Mostafa Orad, was gunned down in Charlie's hallway. Many Muslims joined the rallies and held up Je suis Charlie signs or pens. A French Muslim cafe owner was threatened for putting up a Je suis Charlie sign in his East London cafe. Lassana Bathili, the Malayan born Muslim employee, hid employee customers in the Paris kosher supermarket and as a result saved lives. Even in Iran, a theocracy where blasphemy, heresy, apostasy, enmity against God, and 130 other offenses are punishable by death, there are many examples of solidarity. This is one of them, Nasrin Sutudeh, a human rights lawyer who's been in prison. She showed her solidarity with the journalists at Charlie Hebdo. And many journalists tried to join a rally in support of Charlie, but were stopped by security agents using clubs and chains. An Iranian newspaper was shut down for publishing this photo in solidarity with Charlie. The cartoon is titled, This is what happens if you show solidarity with Charlie in Iran. Another cartoon on this, the closure of the Iranian newspaper, and it's labeled our very own IS. In Tur Turkey, two columnists from a daily are facing investigation for religious defamation after featuring the Charlie cover. And cartoonists from across the world, from Egypt to Lebanon to Qatar and to Jordan, have taken a stand with Charlie against the terrorists. And still we are told that Charlie offended Muslims and must be held to account. Clearly, not all Muslims were offended, and even those who were did not go on to kill for it. What is packaged as the culture of offense is really Islamism's imposition of blasphemy laws and theocracy under the pretext of respect for Muslim sensibilities. Only in Europe, of course, does this far-right fascist movement use offense to silence and censor. In countries where they have state power, there is no need for such niceties. In Saudi Arabia, in Iran, in Pakistan, in Iraq, in Syria, the offenders are called what they are, apostates and blasphemers, and legally murdered in broad daylight in the same way that Charlie Hebdo's journalists were executed. Terrorism and indiscriminate violence, including via Sharia laws, have been pillars of Islamist rule for decades, aiding in creating a climate of fear and as a warning to those who refuse to submit. 
This culture of offense absurdly implies that civility and manners are all that are needed to stop abductations, abductions, abductions, <laughs> abductions and the slaughter of generations in Iran, Algeria to Nigeria. But the culture of offense is a smokescreen, in my opinion. It serves to legitimize Islamist terror and blame victims. It misses the point. Islamism is an international far-right movement that has murdered innumerable Charlie Hebdo's over several decades across the Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, including many Muslims who have dared to speak or mock or just live 21st century lives prohibited by the Islamists. Being a woman, being a free thinker, being gay, being unveiled or just improperly veiled according to them, being an atheist, going to school, driving a car, having sex, falling in love, laughing out loud, dancing, offends them. Calling for civility, censorship, silence, or respect for the offended is merely heeding the Islamist demand for submission at the expense of dissenters. But as Rosa Luxemburg has said, freedom is always, is always the freedom of dissenters. So yes, I am Charlie, but I am also the many Muslims, ex-Muslims, and non, who dissent day in and day out at great risk to themselves. I am Raif Badawi, sentenced to 10 years in prison and a thousand lashes for a website promoting public discussion of religion and politics, which has been deemed insulting of Islam by the Saudi regime. I am 30-year-old blogger Sohail Arabi, here with his five-year-old daughter, sentenced to execution in Iran for insulting the Prophet on Facebook. I am poet Fatma Naoud on trial for insulting Islam in Egypt due to her criticism of Islamic animal slaughter. I am 28-year-old Mauritius, Mauritian journalist and anti-slavery activist Mohammad Sheikh Mukhaiter, who's been sentenced to death in December for insulting the Prophet. I am 32-year-old Egyptian journalist Bishoy Bulus Armia, who's been given a five-year prison sentence for causing sectarian strife and insulting Islam because he reported on the persecution of Christians in Egypt. I am the artists and writers in the Gaza Strip who are facing a campaign calling for their murder for insulting Islam. I am Jakarta Post Editor-in-Chief, Mehdi Atama, who's accused of blasphemy for a caricature of ISIS, which according to an Islamist group which filed a complaint, has insulted Islam. I am Algerian novelist Kamal Daoud, who has called for his execution because of insults to Allah. I am bloggers Yi and Li, 25 and 26, charged in Malaysia under the Sedition Act for insulting Islam and Ramadan on Facebook. I am women's rights campaigner Soad al-Shamari, who's been in prison since October last year on accusations that she's insulted Islam and the Prophet in Saudi Arabia for demanding an end to male guardianship rules for women. I am 47-year-old British-Iranian Roya Nobah, who was sentenced to 20 years in prison in Iran for insulting Islam on Facebook. All she said was that the Iranian regime is too Islamic. I am 49-year-old mother of five, Asya Bibi, who's been in prison for five years in Pakistan awaiting execution for blasphemy. I'm 27-year-old Mohammad Amir Aslani, hanged in September last year in Iran for insulting Prophet Jonah and making innovations in religion through interpretations of the Qur'an. And I am Muhammad Shakil Aouj, Dean of the Faculty of Islamic Studies at the University of Karachi, who was shot dead by gunmen in September last year, two years after being accused of blasphemy. The list goes on and on. So yes, I am Charlie, Raif, and Roya. No ifs and buts. I am, we are, all of them. Thank you.
hope you enjoyed uh, the uh, speech on uh, giving tribute to Charlie Hebdo and dissenters across what is considered the Muslim world. But again, it's not the Muslim world. It is part of the world and there are people who are Muslims and not within those societies. And even if they are Muslims, they don't necessarily all agree with each other and they definitely don't necessarily agree with the Islamists. I mean, going back also to the other aspect of this argument is that Islam is to blame. And in a sense, yes, Islamists do use Islam as the banner, but you don't get rid of the Spanish Inquisition by banning the Bible. You don't attack or you can't fight back against the Christian right in America by targeting only the Bible. You've got to see the Christian right, the Islamic right, the Hindu right as part of a regressive fascist political movement and fight it politically. I think um, uh, I personally believe that there are two aspects to this. One is that to recognize and put the emphasis on um, the political movement that exists because these are organized fascist groups. Yeah. Um, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you had the right wing fascist military. Uh, joined us in, in, in South America, Iran, Middle East, and they were, you know, they, they, they were using nationalism as uh, the banner of uh, controlling um, state power and, and uh, keeping themselves in position. Now it's Islam they, they're using as, as, um, um, as a banner. So you recognize this is a, a political interest, it's a political group, it's a political movement. That's, that's a key, I think, for uh, any decent sort of analysis of the situation. Mm. But at the same time, you have you have to you can't just ignore uh, the fact that there is a religion uh, who has the capacity, like any other religion, right? Mm -hmm. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, any right wing Buddhist sort of uh, uh, um, religion, they all have beliefs. Um, they all have the capacity to be used mm -hmm. and become a banner. Definitely. But yeah. you know, you, you need to make sure that you don't mix these these two up, you have to criticize, you I have mean, to show I think it's, they, there is a relationship, however, the emphasis and the focus needs yeah. to be on a political movement. I, I mean, that's I think that's the point. The point is where should the emphasis be? And yeah. I think you will get it very wrong if you emphasize Muslims, immigrants, you'll get it very long, wrong if you're only emphasizing Islam. Um, as the, the crux of the problem, because then you fail to see that this is a political mm. movement that needs to be challenged politically. And therefore, I think, you know, in, in a sense, whilst there are some truths in the fact that, yes, you know, is, uh, the Islamists are using Islam as their banner, nonetheless, banning Islam, you it's know, it, it won't help. It, uh, absolutely. I, I think, it, it, you know, banning any sort of ideology thought is, is not, is not sort of doesn't help anything. You need to be able to criticize it and show the link, show how cruel and inhuman it is, mm -hmm. but at the same time recognize this is a political movement and you need to challenge it politically. And that's yeah. the key. And I mean, also, it's important to be able to see people uh, for the uh, for you know, for what they are in a sense, because what happens is if you only see people as Muslims or or people who are followers of Islam and say, well, this is what their book says, so this is what they are, then you fail to see the humanity yeah. in in you know, countless people across the world who 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 live in very human ways and who don't necessarily represent those beliefs in any way, shape, or form. <laughs>In shocking news of the week, we are discussing the tragic execution of Saman Nassim, a young Kurdish political prisoner in Iran who was 17 when he was arrested and charged with enmity against God. Yeah, he was um, a, a young man uh, who was arrested by Sepa Revolutionary Guards uh, on the border in Iran. He was a member of a, a Pejak, a political group. He was 17 and the Islamic regime had no regard for his age. They condemned him to execution and, um, and recently um, they've executed him. Um, in the final days uh, to his execution, there was huge uh, uproar across the world. Mm -hmm. People were protesting and objecting to his uh, execution of this young man. Um, European Union objected, uh, um, Swedish M you know, Foreign Ministry got involved, Amnesty International uh, run a campaign and the International Committee Against Execution also. Uh, was involved in uh, organizing protests across the world. But the, the key issue was that the Islamic regime 
um, didn't even tell his parents for a f for for a f you know 24 hours. They were they didn't know whether he's executed or not. They were they, mm -hmm. they were playing cat and mouse with a bit of family, which is really really shocking. Mm -hmm. That shows the brutality of this uh, this government. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, when you look at the question of executions, you you do really understand why it is a you know a sort of state-sponsored murder from uh, from the state on behalf of supposedly all of society and in a place like Iran anywhere it's uh, you know just something that shouldn't be tolerated whether it's the US whether it's China uh, in in Iran as well you have a situation where the family members the, the oftentimes the lawyers don't know what's happening sometimes people don't even have access to their lawyers their families don't know what's going on uh, and, you know, sometimes they'll find out that their child's been executed just because later on they've been told, well, come and pick up his stuff. Mm. And just the sort of not knowing, as well as all the torture, you know, Salman himself talked about the heinous tortures that he faced in order to force him to confess. Mm. And the charge itself, enmity against God, the most absurd sort of accusations, inhumane accusations, you know, um, against people for um, expressing their opposition to a brutal regime. Yeah, yeah. In the insane fatwa of the week, it's one from Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme spiritual leader of Iran. And he's basically said that in Iran, in, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, there are no acts of aggression against non-Muslims. He says this, having issued a fatwa against Baha'is, where he said that Muslims should have no contact with them. And he said that in Europe, Muslims have no physical security and they've got no rights. I mean, he's got it all wrong and backwards, upside down, any way, which way you can think of. Supreme leader, <laughs> spiritual. This guy is uh, I, the cheek of the propaganda machine of the Islamic regime uh, is bottomless. Mm. You know, it's just unbelievable how far they could go. Uh, you know, there, there is no limit to, to the lying, bareface, bareface lying of the Islamic regime and his, and his supreme leader. When the leader sort of says, says this, he's teaching his sort of followers to argue uh, in this manner, as, I mean, as Reza Moradi said the other day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing is that this is just barefaced bullshit propaganda. The reality of the matter is, is that the Islamic Repub Republic of Iran under Khamenei's very rule, has slaughtered people, Muslims and non, left, right and center. They have no respect for any human life. How dare they say that there is no acts of aggression against non-Muslims in I Iran. think Khamenei should zip it. Yeah, definitely. Zip it. <laughs> Now we thought we would end our programs on a high note and we don't want to end with insane fatwas and shocking news and this week's high note is about Mahin Alipur who is a wonderful women's rights campaigner living in Sweden, Iranian born, who recently won the Hero of the Day award uh, given by a Swedish magazine. And this is an annual, um, I think, um, um, celebration of women from different walks of life. Mm -hmm. uh, she was in the category of hero of, hero of, the, um, of the day um, and when um, sort of name was sort of um, elected by popular vote as, uh, as a person in Sweden, um, she went on the stage and says, she said she represents masses of women who have suffered on the Islamic regime and, uh, and, and she, she was proud to represent this movement, and I think this is brilliant. And we're really very we should, proud of Mahin as we well. We congratulate her. Well done, and Mahin. all her efforts. Yes. Well done. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this week's program. Uh, please do write to us uh, about your views. Uh, send us message, text, email, comments, anything. We look forward to hear your views about your uh, our program. And uh, we hope you enjoyed watching us. We'll see you again next time at the same time and same place. Until then, have a fantastic week. Bye.